Hi! My name is Shadow and I'm going to give you a brief oversight over great thoughts around the world. And we are starting today with the German Zweihander. The Zweihander has its origins in the German-speaking regions of Central Europe in the 16th and 17th century. The word Zweihander means two-hander in English, but the word Zweihander wasn't used back then for these kind of big swords. It was used for the long swords. Just like the Biedenhander, which means the Bilfhander, and Beidfäuster, which means Bilfister. But they were all used for the longsword originally. This kind of sword was called back then a Schlachtschwert, which has several meanings in English, but the closest one would be the Battle Sword. So, how was a Central European battle sword built? The sword itself was about as high as its user and this ranged from chin high to a little bit over the head. That translates to a height of 1 meter and 60 to 1 meter 90. Video games tend to portray this kind of sword as a heavy, clunky metal beam. But the truth is, most of them seldomly exceeded 3 kilograms or 6.6 .6 pounds. My freaking cat weighs twice as much. You see this? This weighs more than this one here. I'm looking at you, sorry, Tinker. Oh, come on, you're perfect the way you are. Otherwise, this here would be very cumbersome to use in combat. They, these kind of battle swords were more livelier and nimblier than video games and movies give them credit for. Now let's talk about the different parts of a Schlachtschwert or the battle sword. We start with the pommel right here. The pommel of a Schlachtschwert had mostly a rounded shape, like a pear or a cone. It helped secure the lower hand on the hilt from slipping off when it became wet from, oh, well, blood, sweat, rainwater and I presume other body fluids. The next part of the Schlachtschwert is the hilt. The hilt of a Schlachtschwert usually took about one quarter of the whole length of the sword. And the hilt was quite long. You could place four hands on it, so you could grip it with the hands quite apart to use the leverage to your advantage. The grip shape had a very big variety, just like longsword's head, but since it is a battlefield weapon, the more pragmatic forms were preferred. Now let's talk about the crossguard of a battle sword. When I did my research about this topic, I didn't know that the crossguard would be an indicator of the origin country where the sword is coming from. Usually the crossguard of a Schlachtschwert from Central Europe would be very huge, just like shoulder broad and heavily decorated. Very, very beautifully and heavy decorated. However, the earlier form of the Schlachtschwert had a very different crossguard. It was more like S-shaped and rounded. In this form, the crossguard wouldn't got caught in the puffy arms of the Landsknecht garments. Some of these swords also featured a thumb ring for more control of the sword while fighting. I think the protective value is neglectable since it was very thin. Some call this kind of crossguard a pretzel guard but the Danish Zweihänder had the real pretzel crossguard. And I'm going to tell you about it more in a different video. When this kind of sword became larger, the crossguard also became larger and got its old T-shape again. They also featured these side rings for more hand protection. 
Also, the cross guard itself became more heavily decorated and ornamented. Some of these protruding ornaments tended to catch the enemy's weapons, so you could use them to bind the enemy's weapon and use it to your advantage. But personally, these shapes reminded me heavily on old garden gates with the curved shapes and rolls. These side rings on the cross guard were usually open in Germany and you could still use the thumb grip if you needed to. These side rings on the cross guard could also be closed with a floral patterned plate in Germany to protect your hands more. If you had these kind of protection you couldn't use the thumb grip anymore but you always trade in some flexibility for protection. The Swiss mercenaries had a very similar Schlachtschwert, but their crossguards were a bit different. Whereas the German side rings were open, the Swiss ones were closed with metal plates. Also, the guard itself would be a narrow rounded T-shaped bar, which is a very pragmatic approach, but it still did the job of protecting the hand and catching enemy's weapons. In Austria, the Styrian battle sword would feature two more arms on the crossguard that would curve toward the Ricasso. It also featured double side rings, just like on the Spanish Montante. I think the additional arms on that would curve toward the Ricasso uh, would make half sorting a bit more difficult, but I haven't wielded one, so I can only assume it. Next part of the battle sword is the Ricasso. The Ricasso was a portion of the blade that was next to the crossguard and blunt on purpose. The earlier Schlachtschwerter didn't have a ricasso, but as soon as the sword got longer, they also started to feature this ricasso, which became a very important part of the battle sword. The ricasso was invented to allow a more secure half sorting on a huge sword. Some sword techniques involved grabbing the sword by the blade, and a sword of this size was heavier than a long sword. So they invented the ricasso to open up more fencing strategies like using the sword as a short spear for more point control. Some techniques of displacing enemy weapons also involved gripping the ricasso. This blade portion could be blank or decorated with grooves or wrapped around with leather for more convenience like most of the German styled battle swords. Gripping the battle sword by the ricasso also came with its own risks. First, it shortened your reach, and second, it put your hand further forward, which resulted in more attacks to the hand. That's why the pairing looks or horns were invented. Pairing looks or pairing horns were little crossguards that came right after the rigasso. They would protect your hands from enemies' weapons that were sliding down the blade. And they could also catch enemies' blades to bind them better. Very useful for spear techniques. Pairing horns also had their regional differences. There were, for example, the southern or Munich-styled pairing horns that were curved upwards toward the tip that looked way more brutal, like the northern style, which had the pairing horns curved toward the hand. Central European battle swords usually tended to have very pronounced pairing looks and pairing horns, but there were also types which didn't feature those, and these kind of battle swords also didn't feature a ricasso, just like the earlier types. And now let's have a look at the variety of blade shapes for a battle sword. There were the classic straight ones with the parallel edges that would end up in a lightly rounded tip. And also there were blades that would start narrower and get wider near to the tip, reminding me of a bit oversized gladius, but very beautiful. 
And you guessed it. That was the Flamberge. This kind of blade shape came in pretty late. And so it was presumably more to show off the wealth of its user. So did it have no other purpose? I'd say yes, it had. The 16th century garments of a mercenary had very puffy and flamboyant arms, which could provide cushion. And although the Schlachtschwerter were very sharp, they had problems to cut through this. So, this blade shape here could bite better into the puffy arms and cut them open, just like the rescuing knife of a paramedic. Experimenting with a Flamberge myself, I've also found out that this blade shape was very good in catching wooden shafts of spears and pikes because the inward curve digged way better into the shaft and if the sword was sharpened, this is my training sword, it would have held the shaft much better and controlled the weapon of the enemy. Many regional characteristics of a battle sword could also be mixed up because the German battle sword blades were so well made and so well received they got exported to other nations as well, just like for example Scotland with the Lowlander battle sword. Now we know the anatomy of a Schlachtschwert, but how was this beast here used? Well, unfortunately there are no written sources left that teach the usage of a Schlachtschwert, either from Germany, Austria or from Switzerland. However, Joachim Meyer mentions in his manuscripts in the chapters for Staffs and Dussacks the technique of Triben and says that it's also suitable for a strong big man with a Schlachtschwert. And I agree. You can use these techniques while half-sorting or in the usual sword grip. On the other hand, in Albrecht Dürer's manuscripts about long sword techniques, you can find circular and very fluent motions that could be applied to a Schlachtschwert. They remind me of the reglas of a Montante or Spadone, which I'm going to talk about in a later video. Maybe even the next one I'm going to link here. One of the few sources that mentions the Schlachtschwert at all comes from André Pauernfeind. In a preamble of his manuscript he says, Here follows the chapter for the longsword that is used for battle swords, rider swords and trika. I hope I translated it well enough. In this chapter he shows longsword techniques from Lichtenauer himself and Meyer. There are also many house sorting techniques that can be naturally applied to a battle sword since it has a ricasso like this. So the written sources how to use a Schlachtschwert are very limited, but we do have plenty of paintings and other iconographical sources that shows that show us how a Schlachtschwert was used. Famously, this was the weapon of a mercenary from the Holy Roman Empire, which was called Landsknecht. And the correct plural of Landsknecht is Landsknechte. It has an E in the end. And the Swiss mercenaries who also had these gigantic swords were called Reisläufer. Main battlefield weapons tended to be pole arms like spears and billhooks, or in case of the Landsknecht, pikes and halberds. Even firearms like the arquebus were preferred main battlefield weapons. The sword tended to be a sidearm that came to use when your main weapon broke or if the enemy was too near to use the main battlefield to your advantage. The battle sword was different. It was a battlefield and a main weapon for strategic use. Informations battle swords weren't present in higher numbers, but they were there. 
The front rows consisted mostly pikesmen, and after that there were halberds and the Schlachtschwertira, the wielder of the Schlachtschwert. Rumors say that Schlachtschwerter were especially used to cut off pike heads, but there are no written sources for this claim. What we do have are some iconographical images where pike heads are laying on the ground while a Schlachtschwertira is nearby. But we have to look at this skeptical. A pike is a very thick, long wood that is flexible at the point and cutting it down is very time consuming with a Schlachtschwert and you can't concentrate on a single pike since there are multiple ones right pointing at your own face. So this use is too risky. What you could have done with a Schlachtschwert was to push the pikes on one side, our side, to open up a path for your comrades to run through and do some damage, or for yourself to run through the path and cut down the first roads. After a while, when an enemy's formation dissolved into littler piles or even single persons running away, the greatsword users came into play. They were sent out with equally well-equipped comrades to destroy these little piles, because a greatsword is a big and imposing weapon and it could easily deflect the enemy's one-handed weapon while simultaneously hitting the person behind it. If the situation allowed it, these kind of little units with the Schlachtschwert and other weapons would also attack the enemy's bigger formation from the sides, retreat and attack from another side again just to distress them in a guerrilla kind of fighting. They were called Plenkler. Another usage of the Schlachtschwert was to protect the Bannermen as a whole Schlachtschwert unit. The Schlachtschwert was a big sign for everyone that the formation was still intact, so it had to be protected at all costs. If the banner kept on being visible and upright, everyone else kept on fighting till the end. But just as important as the banner was the mercenary fund. You wouldn't be a mercenary if there was no pay, right? So they were protected as well from Schlachtschwert units. Another field where the Schlachtschwert was very important was, well, imagine the pikemen before you fell. So the Schlachtschwert user alongside the Halabardiers were the first line of defense for the rows right behind you. On the battlefield, when gunners opened fire, they had a very long reload time since their arquebus and muskets were front-loaded powdered weapon which could fire twice a minute. It took so roughly 30 to 40 seconds to reload the whole weapon, aim it and shoot what's before you. So it was this time frame of ceased fire where the Schlachtschwert, Schlachtschwert users were sent forward to eliminate the gunners. It may also have helped that they developed a breastplate that could withstand musket fire to a certain degree and the bullets were most likely to glance off the rounded shapes. So when the Schlachtschwert user came too near for the gunner and he couldn't use his gun already, they had to resort to their sidearms which were no match for the Schlachtschwert. A Schlachtschwert isn't known to be a civilian weapon in contrast to a Montante or Spadone. It was reserved for the battlefield or for guardsmen. On parades, it was mainly for showing off. Speaking of which, there's a series of very heavy, large and strongly ornamented battle swords. They were mostly for ceremonial purposes and used to hold in front of you by a parade, hence the name Parade Sword, like the Brunswick Sword. They were mostly not even sharp, so 
They were mostly for showing off. They were very beautiful ones and they were held before the Schlachtschwert unit to announce it on parades. In conclusion, the Schlachtschwert was a fierce weapon against lightly or non-armored opponents. It was not that common as a weapon like a halberd or a pike for a mercenary, but they still had their own technical uses. They were good for guarding certain people, certain positions or important goods, and they could finish off broken formations or gunners who were reloading. Even the most common Schlachtschwert was one of the biggest swords in the 16th century and had their own finesse. If you liked my brief overview over the Zweihander Battlesword, feel free to like and subscribe. Our next destination will be South Europe, where we will talk about the Montante and Spadoni. So, see you next time!